Exactly. Yeah, and I, I agree that some of them are misleading. And it's one of those things where, because it's a sensitive topic, inflation, there, there's kind of misleading aspects on both sides. Uh, and that's it. So, you know, the misleading part about some of those year over year numbers uh, that, that, that Joe was correct about is that you're comparing that one year where, where commodities fell into a hole, right? Because like, China just like stopped buying energy, stopped buying copper. They're the biggest buyers. Uh, they were totally shut down. Uh, and then you kind of exploded out of that that big that big kind of you know down part. And so the year over year numbers are ridiculous. Uh, but for example, if you back up and you look at you know commodities over the past ten to fifteen years, most of them actually are not at all time highs. So lumber is you know that that's been the that's been like the it looks like a Bitcoin chart. And then you have um, uh, gold touched new all time highs in 2020. Uh, it's been in a correction, but it it still touched it. Uh, beef is at all all time highs, uh, but for example, the the overall, if you if you take an aggregate of most commodities, it's actually been in like a ten to fifteen year bear market, uh, and just because we had a period of you know in in the two thousands, you had a period of you know uh, China had a fast growth rate. There was a lot of commodity demand. Uh, we we brought a lot of new commodity supplies online, uh, and then when China slowed down and the whole world kind of uh, adapted to this, you know. We've been in this period of commodity oversupply. And so I think a lot of those year over year numbers, you know, basically a lot of commodities are just getting back up to where they were before. Like oil is just back up to where it was before the pandemic. Uh, There's some like copper that are that are elevated, but still not at all time highs. And then there are some that are at all time highs like lumber. But then the funny thing is, if you look at timber, right, which is, you know, before it becomes lumber, it's timber. That's actually, you know, not that expensive at all. It's really about the bottlenecks of turning timber into lumber, right? So the the you know the the the, the basically the refining that has to go into cutting that up and and you know getting it treated, uh, and so a lot of that is about supply chain issues. Same thing we're having in the semiconductor industry, where you know there's just not a lot, there's not enough foundries to make the semiconductors, and so on one hand, kind of focusing on those year over year numbers can be misleading, and can you know for 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 readers that know what those base effects are that could even turn them off of, of you know they, they think okay this it this you know people in this industry don't know what they're talking about um on the other hand you know people that are saying there's no inflation you know over especially over these several years are also misleading because you know cpi is a really crappy statistic for the most part and i actually have a chart coming out later today that just shows you know housing has gone up faster than a cpi food has gone up faster than cpi Healthcare has gone up faster than CPI. Tuition's gone up faster than CPI. Uh, you know, uh, the the cover price of the New Yorker magazine has gone up faster than CPI, a lot faster. And so, you know, basically we've had a couple deflationary areas like consumer electronics or things that you can outsource to China. Those have been, you know, globalization, technology. Uh, they've really pushed down the cost for things. Same thing, you know, your cell phone can now do what, you know, 10 of your electronics could do you know, a decade ago. So that's been that's been the deflationary area. But then pretty much anything you can't outsource or that isn't automated has gone up faster than CPI. And for most household budgets, that's still where they spend most of their money. You know, the housing, education for their kids or themselves, uh, healthcare costs, you know, either through themselves or through their employer, which eats into their compensation total. Uh, those are the areas where we spend most of our money. And so it's one of those things where we actually have had pretty significant inflation over the past you know, 10, 20 years. Um, but that year over year number is still somewhat misleading for how fast it's been. Uh, some of the things I'm looking at are the producer price index, uh, which is which is kind of a precursor to inflation. Uh, that's That's been spiking. Uh, you know, just the overall kind of, uh, you can look at the bottlenecks in the industry, like we talked about the semiconductors. Uh, we talked about lumber. Uh, you know, we've seen that in, in shipping over the past few months uh, where just, you know, there's only so many containers and container ships. Uh, and so we have had various supply chain issues. And so that that's how I'm monitoring it, where it's often the case that the truth is in the middle. And that's what I'm finding here with inflation as well, that, that we are getting an inflationary impulse from this fiscal spending. Uh, but it's not like inflation is, you know, a- is absolutely massive uh, in that 12 month period. Yeah, because one of the things I struggle with inflation is I, I think it's one of those things that's quite relative. Um it, it it may be a good measure of uh, the general cost of living, uh, the changes in the cost of living month on month for people. But for example, someone like my uh, my children doesn't really affect them. But what does affect them is if the house prices accelerate to such a rate where 
where maybe they're in their 20s and they will want to buy a house, it's really pushed it out of reach for them. Um, so is the CPI a fair rate of calculated inflation? Should we have multiple calculations? I think there should be multiple kind of measures of inflation. And in some sense, there are. I mean, that's why there's things like producer price indexes are useful. Uh, you can also just look at, you know, what is the raw, you know, commodity index doing? So it's what are what are commodity prices doing? That's one of the big factors of inflation. Uh, generally, you don't have strong inflationary periods without commodity prices also uh, going up a lot. Uh, but like I said, over the past decade, the problem is that, you know, the th the big areas of spending that most people spend their money on have gone up faster than wages uh, and have gone up faster than the official CPI. And so that includes housing, that includes uh, food, that includes, uh, you know, health care, tuition, child care, uh, things that you can't outsource or that are not deflated away by by technology and smartphones and things like that. Uh, and so whereas, you know, on the other hand, your TV got cheaper, your computer got cheaper, but those are generally pretty small percentages of a household budget. And so some of those other, uh, you know, uh, things are really important. Another factor that's weird about housing is that, you know, uh, obviously CPI does not really take into account most asset prices. So it doesn't take into account you know, asset price inflation in the mm -hmm. stock market or, or private businesses. Um, it only partially factors in real estate, but it does it in a weird way. And so you actually have a thing where, you know, houses have gone up faster than inflation in most markets. Uh, so, so they've outpaced inflation. Uh, but then, for example, because we've been in this kind of multi-decade trend of lower, lower interest rates, including mortgage rates, the actual monthly payment to afford a house hasn't really gone up that much, uh, even though the cost of the house has. And so that can that can push down kind of the quirky, wonky, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of owning a shelter. Uh, however, it's unfortunate that that doesn't change the fact that people still have to take on more debt relative to their income in order to afford that house. Uh, and so basically it just means that, you know, of, of the monthly kind of, you know, uh, plan that they're doing, more of that at least goes to the house than goes to interest uh, to the bank. Uh, but it's basically those, those policies are still propping up uh, housing prices. And so an ideal case would be, you know, to have, have for, for especially for new people entering the market, for housing prices to be, you know, cheaper than they are, especially on a, a ratio of like, you know, housing price to, to median annual wages. Is there any risk whereby we come out the long-term debt cycle? And I don't know what point that would be, but interest rates will then start to go up and people might be trapped with payments they can't afford on houses they've taken on with these low interest rates. Is, is, that, a, is that a serious risk? Is that a serious concern for central banks when setting interest rates? Well, that was a huge, that was a big factor in what caused the subprime mortgage crisis, uh, you know, back in 2007, which was that these people, they bought it, you know, they were, there was predatory marketing, you know, really dumb, like, uh, you know, uh, things by banks. And then, and then people bought into houses they couldn't afford. Uh, and so a lot of them, what the way they did it was they had a really, really low, uh, variable rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, and so after like five years that had like a contracted thing where it could bump up to a market rate and suddenly they couldn't afford that house anymore, mm -hmm. uh, which they really couldn't afford it from the beginning, but now they literally couldn't afford the payments. Uh, and so that, that triggered this cascade of defaults that happened. Uh, and now, so that's not a problem for people that have say 30 year fixed rate mortgages or even 15 year fixed rate mortgages. I know different countries all have different kind of practices for what is normal for, for kind of a housing financing scheme. Uh, and so it, it is a factor for variable rate mortgages. Um, and so generally after long-term debt cycle, usually interest rates normalize, uh, but there's always a big question of of what is, you know, what is what is a normal interest rate, and it, obviously it changes based on on what society is doing, what demographics are like, whether there's a period of kind of uh, you know technology boom happening, like you know there's period, like, technology doesn't really happen linearly, right? We have we mm -hmm. have these big discoveries like you know the, the using oil or the internal combustion engine or electricity or the internet and smartphones, right? So you have these kind of bursts of 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 growth. Uh, and that can kind of, you know, temporarily suppress, uh, you know, costs for, for, you know, a number of years. Uh, but over time, you know, interest rates, you know, should eventually normalize, but I, don't, I wouldn't expect that anytime very soon. Uh, and it's one of those things where, you know, if you had a theoretical environment, like you say, say the free banking era in the United States, where you didn't have like a centralized 